the price of success, the problematic business of football. I wanted to critique this modern MBA because I think it's so endemic of a lot of the problems that I'm talking about today. Price of success, the problematic business of football. Ironically, it's presented by public.com and nothing about this is public. That doesn't really matter. Right now, YouTube sucks so much. Every top rated channel is so self-referential. It's just talking about itself. Like and subscribe, like and subscribe, like and subscribe. I don't even want to pay for YouTube anymore because everything is itself an advertisement. I try to, you know, I pay for YouTube not to be part of the bullshit, but instead there's even more bullshit. YouTube itself has become bullshit. So self-referential. So what I'm talking about, about YouTube, this critique of YouTube is not a sidestep of what I'm talking about right now. So today I just want to talk about the complexity and the interplay between nationalism the modernity, soccer, and the postmodern neoliberalism that's manifesting in all spheres of life. But I'm going to use the world of football as an example here, and it's going to be my background. So I'm going to dissect the controversial European Super League proposal, a trend that has become apparent, not just in football, but in everything else. The transformation of football clubs from the historical cultural embodiment to a platforming of neoliberal commodification. And I use that word itself, capitalist platforming. That's what platforming culture has done. So neoliberalism, in essence, as we've talked about before, is the moralization, normalization, justification, and even legalization of this commodification process inherent within capitalism. So commodification isn't evil. It's the moralization and justification of that commodification is incredibly evil. So when it comes to apply those principles to deeply cultural and historical construct of a football club, social construct, it runs into resistance. I'm going to take that social construct idea and extend it further. These are social constructs, but it's only the narcissists who think that they can be at the helm of changing the social construct. They can, they are the ones that control what they can control how the social construct is, is shaped. And these are the same neoliberal ideologies from psychology, from the hive mind idioms that we hear that are invading our social. So a football club can't just be an entirely an entity that's just for sale because it's a representation of shared experiences, collective memories, and community spirit. Okay. It's it's the only refuge of na nationalism. Football clubs are even more important than nationalism to today, I think. <laughs> People are willing to die more for football clubs than for the fake democracies that we've built, for the, the moral bankrupt democracies that we've built in the, in the West. Please watch my video on the bankruptcy, moral bankruptcy. So the in ESL, I'm going to call it, the Super League, I'm going to call it ESL, the European Super League. Proposal was a glaring example of this neoliberal attempt at transformation, attempt and failure. And <laughs> that's the good thing about it. It suggested that a closed league structure that abandoned the time honored system of promotion and relegation, the whole league system, thereby creating an elite class of untouchable clubs, just trying to make it a brand name. They're trying to make all these clubs into brand names. It proposed to include clubs based on brand reputation rather than recent performance, historical performance, historical memory, discounting the tradition of merit-based structure in football. Now look at the merit-based attack by all of neoliberal intersectionality. They're all attacking merit and replacing merit with makeup culture prostitution. What can be seen as a shift from viewing supporters as fans to treating them as consumer. It favored global consumer base over local community support or just community support at all. It saw matches not as historical competitions steeped in tradition and meaning. You know, I was thinking about how Sir Alex Ferguson got really pissed off at Van Nistelrooy for trading shirts with a Manchester City player. No, that's incredibly important. And all, all these people are saying that Van Nistelrooy did the right thing by being sportsmanship. No, it was Sir Alex Ferguson that is maintaining the meaning of soccer. Soccer isn't just about throwing a fucking ball in the net 
it has more meaning than it has more drama than it has more historical continuity than even a lot of the the memories of nations today, especially because nationalism is so eroded today. In essence, it turned the football club into a brand and com- tried to commodify the spirit of the sport. You cannot commodify spirit. And I'm going to be connecting this to other issues as well. This tendency to, to commodify cultural touchstones, cultural product touchstones, the under this tendency to commodify cultural touchstones under the guise of progress, okay, is an example of what we have previously referred to as hive mind idiot. The ESL proposal was an emblematic of, was idiomatic, was, you know, the best example of this trend, an attempt to undermine the meaningfulness of the sport by reducing it to a mere product, an OnlyFans subscription service of sorts. However, this is, there is hope to be found in the backlash. You can see the human spirit in the backlash. Fans all over the world rallied against this attempt to commodify and prostitute their passion and sell their history. They refused to let their s- beloved sport a uh, matter of who can, a pro- prostitution of the highest bidder, basically. Sell out culture. The vehement opposition underscores the fact that football is much more than just a business or just a game. It's a sport with deep cultural and historical roots, with connections to communities and nations. We have to strive to retain the true spirit of not just football, but the human spirit, resisting to attempts to transform, transmogify our the beautiful game with its history, community, collective memory. And this existence to be hollowed out by prostitution, commodification. And it's not, again, it's not the commodification that's the problem. It's the moralization, justification as this modern NBA channel so exquisitely exemplified. It's about the heart, the spirit, and the shared passion. The neoliberal commodification that attempts to transfigure football into a mere product is not an isolated incident. The same hive mind idioms that try to rationalize and destigmatize this transformation are also at place in other facets of our lives. They are utilized to justify the mercenary-like behavior and of other situations. Think of the Wagner group in, in Russia or the mercenaries that sell out their country all over the world. There's mercenary-like behavior, prostitution mercenary, and undermine the collective labor action through encouraging the acceptance of scabs. Everyone, you see this uh, right-wing understanding all the time that justifies scab. The left and the right converge on this issue. The left converges on this issue when it comes to prostitution, literal prostitution, and the right uh, says the same kind of arguments with regards to people blocking the streets for scabs. I have to get to work, right? This it's the same the same justification of neoliberal subjectivity. Mercenaries are individuals who offer their combat skills to the highest bidder, commodify the concept of loyalty and duty that is inherent in the military profession. In in terms of martial arts, the idea of martial arts, how when to use violence. Instead of serving a nation or a cause, their allegiance is to who pays the most. Sometimes that allegiance can go to the next level too, because that's where you can have, there's a whole thing about uh, Italian mercenary armies that are actually very interesting. I, I highly recommend that you take a look that even prostitution culture can't fully work in the mercenary idea as well. Similarly, union scabs, those who cross picket lines during labor strikes, effectively commodify their labor in a way that undermines the collective efforts by their workers. By choosing individual gain over collective solidarity, they weaken the collective bargaining power of unions and the very concept of worker solidarity. And this is why I love Spivak's idea of not affirmative action, but actually affirmative sabotage. It goes quite neatly with the Arentian example of who is worth listening to in today's prostitution, everybody is a guru economy. Who is worth listening to are those that are willing to sacrifice their lives, their social capital, compared to all of these self-referential YouTube channels that are destroying our brain. People today look at my channel on and they say, oh, you only have 600 subscribers. You might, you must not be worth shit. This fucking idea that is invading our brains as well. 
how who who do we trust is whoever has the most subscribers then guess what <laughs> and the mechanism okay so the problem here is that there is a notion of shame that is crucial in society and this is the opposite of all of these neoliberal pill now there's a pill shaming movement anti pill shaming movement and you can see regardless of all the re replicability crisis in psychiatry and psychology regardless of the crisis of the sciences 50 years of this crisis of the sciences going on i'm going to i'm going to post the picture in the link below just this hive mind repeating of bullshit for 40 50 60 years that's affecting the sciences itself regardless of that we have this pill sh anti pill shaming move that is so akin so very similar to the hive mind idioms found in the anti slut shaming move is not about promoting personal humiliation or distress but rather it's about encouraging individuals to reflect upon their potential societal consequences of their action. It is a mechanism of preserving values such as loyalty, solidarity, and collective action, which are under threat in a neoliberal, shameless society. All these shame hashtags are, most of them, I guess, <laughs> are part of this. When the mechanism of shame erodes, and one of my professors, Christina Tarnakovsky, he wrote a book on plato and shame i highly recommend it when shame erodes we are left in a society that lacks any solidarity that lacks kinship that lacks friendship everything is subject to inter constant cost benefit analysis of privilege and emotional labor a society where individuals act in self-interest even when such actions undermine truly collective efforts or traditional values and i'm, I'm not standing for traditional values for the sake of traditional values here I'm saying that there's a reason, there's a memory, there's a history with soccer, with all of these ideas. There's a guy uh, trying to justify OnlyFans and saying that it shouldn't be shamed because some, some kid committed suicide uh, because his parents or his mom was uh, selling OnlyFans and every, all the kids were making fun of him. And the guy was one of these social narcissists. His idea was that Oh, it's the it's the shaming that's the problem. No, it's not the sh it's not necessarily the shaming that's that's the problem. Okay, if it's the problem, then hey, buddy, tell me your mother's OnlyFans account. What's your mother's OnlyFans account? He comes out and tries to destigmatize it. I don't know if it was he or they or whatever it was. They were saying that we should destigmatize it. That's the problem. But these are the so these are the narcissists. I think that they can sh change social construction. Just because something is a social construction doesn't mean you can go willy-nilly change it. There's a reason why it's there. So this breeds a culture that only not only accepts, but encourages sellout behavior. All of it. It's all because of the American Psychological As Association. I blame them the most because they're the ones releasing these hive mind idioms into our society and they become self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's crucial to critically evaluate these trends and understand their implications, the far-reaching effects of neoliberalism. The rise of neoliberal pop psychology further complicates this landscape, reinforcing the mindset that enables sellout culture that we've been discussing. Key among these hide mind idioms are phrases like setting boundaries and it's too much unpaid emotional labor to educate you, which I've been ranting about for so long. While these concepts can be a useful tool in personal growth, you know, personal per, personal growth. I've talked about this before. That these ideas are good for people who are fucked up. That they can't, they have no, they have no idea of who should be their friends. These, these people that just have no concept of love. Yeah, for those people, they need to define love. Those people, they need to have a barrier about what what love means. I guess. But for the normal people, neoliberal psychology does is give the same panacea. The same solution to all these different situations. So, though it could be good for some people's mental health, it's actually not good for, it's not a panacea. It can't just be used as a solution for all of our ailment. Their interpretation and application within the neoliberal framework, all of these hive mind idioms, often leads to an overly individualist mindset that erodes collective responsibility and social solidarity. I keep saying it, intersectionality destroyed solidarity. So for instance, consider the idea of setting boundaries. This concept when applied healthily can help 
individuals protect their emotional and mental health well being. But because it's a high mind idiom, it doesn't actually do that. <laughs> Under the neoliberal perspective, this idea can be twisted to justify a withdrawal from collective engagement or justify the commodification of interpersonal interaction. In the principle of setting boundaries overemphasized, it can lead to the erosion of our social responsibilities and shared spaces, driving us into silos of individualism that undermine collective act. Similarly, the notion of unpaid emotional labor can be misused to evade shared responsibility in society. Instead of fostering empathy and mutual understanding, the neoliberal encourages interpretation encourages the view that educating others or helping them understand a particular viewpoint is a waste of time, is an experience of undue burden, and requires compensation. They've turned everything into sophistry. These perspectives foster a transactional worldview in which everyday interaction is measured in terms of individual profit or loss, a cost-benefit analysis, a commodity to be negotiated. It feeds directly into neoliberal subjectivity. These are the soldiers of neoliberal subjectivity. Watch my Carl Ratner video on sexuality and how sexuality is the number one promoter of neoliberal subjectivity today. And all of these people, agreeableness people, just repeating the same shit and contributing to that neoliberal subjectivity, destroying the very essence of what it means to be human. Their experiences, their emotional... And ultimately, their whole existence becomes one of sellout culture, prostitution. A striking example of this sellout culture is the recent unveiling that the Iran-Contra affair during Reagan's pe presidency, where Reagan sold out the American idea of democracy to Iranian terrorists. And I made a short video short on that, where clandestine individuals deal, deal with each other. And the deals were struck to serve the political interests of Reagan administration at the cost of undermining American democratic principle. This instance not only symbolizes the commodification of democracy itself, but also exemplifies the lack of collective responsibility and solidarity that neoliberalism fosters. Ayn Rand on the right and all of these uh, progressive, unwittingly neoliberal colonizers on the left. As a summary, the pervasiveness of the neoliberal subjectivity, the neoliberal ethos by our constant ritual. This is why I focus on rituals so much, because rituals shape our ontology, our daily rituals, our daily rumination, caused, promoted by vicarious traumatization. We are all scared. Vicarious traumatization requires securitization. Cars, all feminism is carceral. All feminism is neoliberal because it believes that the personal is political. And this is what Hannah Arendt, whole life, her whole life, she's been telling us that the personal is not political. We need a space of self-reflection so that we don't become prostitutes. All of this drives the justification, the moralization of sellout culture that commodifies every aspect of our life from football to politics. We need to challenge this neoliberal subjectivity if we wish to remain human. Promoting critical thinking and uphold the values of solidarity and collective responsibility and mutual aid. We owe each other. It's not it's too much unpaid emotional labor to educate you. It's I have a responsibility to you regardless. I have a, I am responsible for that which I deem myself not to be responsible for. That is Derrida. That is Nietzsche. That is what they teach us. Only then can we resist destruction of meaning that's happening. This is why Jordan Peterson is so confused. All these right-wing people are confused because they can't put together this post Ayn Randian conservatism with the pre Ayn Randian conservatism of where we were warned by Eisenhower about the neoliberal industrial con neoliberal military industrial complex or the university industrial complex or the prostitution of absolutely everything. This is why we live in a cyberpunk dystopia. That's why that's my theme of my whole channel to understand of our cyberpunk dystopia. That's why they Make sure that my channel will never get enough followers. If we can resist, we must resist the commodification of our minds and our brains. Our sh because that's what will uphold our democracy against the encroachment, of the destruction of the petrodollar. Now that we're seeing the multipolar world, why does it form? Because everything has become prostitution. Everything 
has become prostitution, which has emboldened the dictator, the dictators who fight the prostitution and fight for something else. What we need is for us to believe in democracy again, to believe in love again. Now look at all the anti-faith arguments against love itself. Thank you for listening and thank you for holding solidarity. From football to politics to love, all has been destroyed by neoliberal colonialism. And I'm writing a book about this. I'm writing a book about neoliberal subjectivity. And I hope that you will take a look when I'm finished. This is going to take a couple months, actually. So it's going to take a while. Thank you for paying attention. Please like and fucking subscribe.